There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head Bring the rain Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I feel very blessed to be here today to share this word with you. Thank you. I believe the Lord's given me to share. Um, John, over there, got me in the cafe and said to me, oh, what are you speaking on? And I said, Jonah, and he said, what, donuts? <laughs> <laughs> so no, not, not donuts. <laughs> but um, yeah, the title of this message is To Do The Thing. And I am going to be speaking out of Jonah. Um, yes, I love Jonah. It's one of my favourite books in the Old Testament. It's really short, it's four chapters long, and it is rich with lessons. And it's one that I would um, encourage you in your quiet times this week to go and chew through. Um, it's really cleverly written. There's lots of humour woven in through it. Um, so it's a really great book to read. But I think there's three points that I want to look at today that I think we can learn from this reluctant prophet. And I'm sure that many of you know the story of Jonah from uh, Sunday school. It's a Sunday school favourite with pictures of whales to colour in. I thought a little recap might come in handy. Jonah was a prophet uh, 2,800 years ago, about, during the reign of King Jeroboam. And he was commissioned by God to go to a city called Nineveh and deliver a message. The message translation says this, that God asked Jonah to deliver a message, and he said, up on your feet and away to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way, and I can't ignore it any longer. Um, Jonah does not like this, so he says no. And he boards a boat to Tarshish, which is 1,500 miles in the opposite direction. He's meant to go northwest, and he goes southeast. Um, and as he boat, as so often happens in scriptures, there's a storm, and to cut a long story short, Jonah ends up in the sea, and then in the belly of the fish, where he stays for three days until he gets spewed up by the fish onto a shore. And this has changed his mind somewhat, and he agrees to go to Nineveh and deliver the message. And when he gets there, he gives the message that God's given him, and the Ninevites, they stop what they're doing, and they repent, and in turn, God turns back from destroying them. And you think Jonah would be happy about this, but he really isn't. And he has this epic rant at God that probably doesn't form the basis for many Christian devotionals or Christian bumper stickers, where he's like, kill me now! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, we're left, we leave Jonah here on the mountaintop, still overlooking Nineveh, kind of hoping for some heavenly nukes to come down that are never going to come in his generation. And... Um, not really understanding why God is so compassionate. So, there's three lessons I want to look at. The first one is that you are not so perfect yourself. Sorry. Um, there might be millions of reasons why we don't want to do what we feel God calling us to do. And it might be hard, or it might be really inconvenient. It might cost us money or time or energy that we don't think we've got to spare. And if it all goes wrong, we might look really stupid in the eyes of the world. But remember that the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God. And his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. Yeah. Right. So we can't judge success and failure in the way that the world does. Which sounds really great up here, but when you're standing on the cusp of potentially making a fool of yourself to the arms of the world. It's a bit more scary. On the face of it, it seemed really obvious why Jonah wouldn't want to go to Nineveh. Because, we'll be clear, they're bad dudes. Um, one historian writes of them that although they were feared and respected, above all, they were hated. Jonah was brought up to hate and fear the Ninevites. Archaeologists have uncovered lovely works of art depicting gory battle scenes and subsequent tortures of their captives. And there's one king by the name of Ashurnasipal II, a bit of a mouthful, he wrote 
and he did a colourful account of his treatment of some nobles that had rebelled against him. And I'm not going to go into details already out because he probably had just had breakfast and was kids were great. But if you think along the lines of um, like nose removal, skinning, and decorating trees with heads, then you're in the right kind of gist. <laughs> so he's a nice guy. But it's not that Jonah didn't want to go because he was scared, that might have been a bit of it. And that he didn't want to risk his head to become uh, one of the lovely, unfested tree baubles in Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because of how unworthy the Ninevites were. He figures if he's going to risk his neck, literally, preaching, that it might as well be for people worth it, mm. not these bunch of nose cutting off, bloodthirsty people. <coughs> When the Ninevites repent, and just as a kind of footnote, when you're reading the book of Jonah, you'll read that the Ninevites repent, and God then repents from destroying them. Um, there's two different, it's a bit complicated, but there's two different words for repent. But what it, what it often is thought to mean is getting on our knees and saying sorry, and often it does. When we're called to repent, most often there's an apology needed to God or to someone else or both. But when God repents, please don't think me irreverent when I say this, he's not going, oh, sorry about that from Nineveh, I want to be carried away. He's saying that he's changing his mind. <coughs> Repentance means he turns around, he changes his mind, he does a 180 degree turn. He was going to destroy them, and then he did not. And that was in response to their repentance, their apology, and their turning around, changing their mind from what they were doing. And that was in response to Jonah's obedience, following his repentance of going to Tarshish. And um, Jonah has this, another, another great round for God, where he complains at God for being too good. And uh, he says to God, didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are merciful and compassionate slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back and destroy people. And he says that like it's a bad thing. And isn't it interesting that God's eagerness to turn back from destroying people and his compassion didn't seem like such a bad thing to Jonah when he was in the belly of a stinking fish. Yeah. Mm. It can be so hard to separate the sinner from the sin and think that people are unworthy because they've done stuff that we hate. But God's really clear on this. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. That is you, sorry, and that's me, shocking. And that's the people that we think are heroes of the faith, the best people we can think of. And that's the people that we think are the lowest of the low. And I will be honest that I kind of, I love Jonah. He's so sulky and stroppy and flawed, and he walks around with his judgy pants, pulled up to here. But God still uses him as a conduit in his ordinariness to bring about the extraordinary. And then I think, well, who am I invites? Uh, people have hurt me, but I've forgiven them. So holy. And uh, I was saying this to my husband, saying, well, I don't, I think these might be my Ninevites, but, you know, I can pray for them. And I don't feel too hard about them. And, and he said to me, well, what about the people that carried out that attack that time? And um, it was about five or six years ago, um, in global news, there had been um, an attack on a village in the Middle East, like there so often is on the news. And I, I'd heard about it, but I hadn't... There wasn't much coverage, so I went Googling to find out some more information, and it was a mistake. And I came across what I thought was a news report, but it wasn't. It was footage. And again, I'm not going to go into details because there's really no need. But what I saw was video footage, presumably filmed by parents. Most of the victims of that massacre were children. And they were filming all the children laid out in this huge room, on the floor, surrounded by horrified relatives. And what I saw left me on my knees, on my living room floor, weeping 
like I have never wept before. This bunch of people I was never going to meet in a place I will never go, probably, broke my heart. And I remember saying to my husband, I will never be the same after this. And I never actually have, but God has turned it around and used that for good in my life. Mm. And when my husband said, oh, what about those people that did that thing? Could you minister to them? Would you risk yourself to try and save them? Um, I would love to stand here and say, yes, sign me up. <laughs> but actually, um, I don't know. And would I go and minister to them? Could I? I'm not so sure. But I do know that I want to be in a place where I can say unequivocally, yes. And since then, um, God hasn't called me to go there to those people. He has called me to pray for them. Yeah. And um, yeah. again, I would love to sit here and say that that was really easy. And I just, my heart had flowed with love for them. But um, actually, I spent 20 very unholy minutes arguing with God yeah. about why I shouldn't. And didn't he know how bad they were? And didn't he know how innocent those kids were? And didn't he know that those children went to bed the night before under the same moon that my kids go to bed under? And that those kids that afternoon were playing under the same sun that my kids play under? As if he wasn't there. And as if he doesn't love them or care for them more than I do. I've got no right to think that I have got any entitlement to feel hurt about things more than God does. And um, now's a good time to say, <laughs> clearly, I'm not coming at this and standing here as somebody who's fully walking in this. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm new to this preaching thing. This is my maiden voyage to the earth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I think preaching goes a bit like this, or at least it can. Me and God work on something. And then I kind of learn some stuff through it. And then I tell you guys about it and invite you to work on it too. And then as a family, as iron sharpens iron, we kind of figure it out together. Yes. Yes. So, although it can be really hard to see for the way God does, and we can only see the bad stuff he's done, he's super clear about what he requires of us. That we have to be a people who do justly, who love mercy, and who look humbly with our God, Micah 6, 8. And if, if he, perfect, sinless, spotless Jesus, will pour out compassion and grace into the world, and will lay down his life for the worst offenders, who are we to think that they're beyond redemption? And who are we to not go and report? Um, Luke 6, 32 to 36 in the message. Puts it like this. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run of the mill sinners do that. If you help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you can get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies, help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, so you must be kind. The thing is, we can assume that our people are beyond redemption and don't deserve mercy and grace. But the good news is that pouring out undeserved mercy and grace is a pastime of our God. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Point number two. I like a three point sermon. Good enough to go. I was. <laughs> point two. God knows better. Isaiah 55 11 tells us that his word will never return void. We have a God who is master of order and strategy and wisdom. Not goose chases, not winging it, and not just hoping for the best. He gives us our callings and our purposes knowing everything there is to know about us and every place that we'll be and every person that we'll encounter and every talent that we've got. And he knew all of that way before he planted the foundations of the earth. So, 
Yeah, but things may not happen in the way that we expected them to. We might have our plans, and we might think that we know how all this is going to go down. But we don't. <laughs> we just have to know the one who does, and trust that he knows best. When Jonah finally goes to Nineveh, and he delivers the world's shortest sermon, he, uh, it's nine words of English, five in Hebrew. In 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. <laughs> it's not like a lot of hope in there. <laughs> There's no altar call, and no, the prayer team right aside. It's just, yeah, your days are numbered. And uh, what's amazing about this is it must be one of the most successful word-for-word sermons ever. Because in five words, 120,000 people in Nineveh, that's around like the population of Exeter, yeah. repented. Wow. Those five words reached the ears of the people, <coughs> and more than that, they reached the heart of the people. And he repented, he turned around, and he called even the animals, it says, repented. <laughs> and uh, it saved 120,000 people from a certain doom because of one man being faithful to one call to deliver one message at the right time, because God ordained him to do it. Which is why it's so important that we know what the call is. I love, I love Philippians 4, 13, that tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But actually, I really think this is where the Amplified Bible really comes into its own for helping us to understand that a little bit deeper, that we can do all things that we are called to do through him who strengthens yeah. and gives us Good. endurance. If we don't know what we're called to do, then we might just be getting on with really good stuff, when really we need to be getting on with really God stuff. And if we don't spend time with him, we're not going to know his voice. Everything comes from the holy place. If we don't give God the opportunity to speak to us, and if we haven't got ears and hearts ready to listen to him, we are not going to know what we're meant to be doing or where we're meant to be going. Commission can only come from the holy place. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 was given to people after they've come into the presence of the risen Jesus and worshipped him and then they listened to him. Now go, make disciples. In Exodus 3, as Moses stood barefoot and blown away in the presence of God with an audible voice, he got his commission. Now go, liberate a nation. Yeah. We can't just wing it, and we can't just come up with really good ideas <coughs> and, uh, and strategies of our own. One conversation with God will ace a million strategies oh. that we can come up with by ourselves. That's true. Everything has to begin with and end with and be sustained by prayer and relationship with God. Yeah. And if this will sound really, really tiring, <laughs> and like hard work. It's not meant to be. Uh, God understands how we're created. And um, I heard this said recently, so I'm gonna rejig it and fit it in here. That um, we can think as people, well we work until we are tired, and then we stop to get our breath back, and then we work again. And, um, and we go, well you know, God worked for six days in the creation story, and then he rested for a day. But there is a news flash here that we're not God. We are people. And we do not show up until the sixth day, where everything begins with a day of rest, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, chitter chattering with God, smelling his flowers, and allowing him to talk to us. And it's from this place of loving him as a father and allowing him to love us as his kids that the very first commission ever came. Now go. Yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. Go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. So my third and final point. We know that we need to stop being so judgy. Yeah. And um, when I say that, I don't mean that we just get to kind of turn a blind eye to sin. That's not it. We do have to stop thinking that people are beyond redemption, so we shouldn't bother. Um, and we know that everything comes from the holy place. And the third point is that people are waiting for you. Um, the Ninevites were waiting for Jonah. They didn't know it, but 120,000 blissfully oblivious lives were at stake, mm. depending on him fulfilling his call. Mm. 
Um, many of you who know me well will know that I have um, an ache in my heart for domestic abuse. And about two years ago, by the way, I think that God often will use an ache in our hearts to show us where our purpose is sometimes. So I follow that and ask God, why have I got this pain? Is this just because I'm human or is this because I'm finding my mission? That's good. Um, and about, yeah, about two years ago, I felt God call me to write a book on the subject of domestic abuse. And I didn't really want to do it. I love the thought of writing a book. It sounds really good. But then actually, in reality, day to day, really boring <laughs> at times. It's really hard. And Comedy Central have got reruns of Friends on at the moment. <laughs> And slowly, slowly, I plodded away at the book. Um, until one day, I was driving along in my car, probably about six months ago now, and um, I can't think what the news report was, but it was something about the increase of domestic abuse statistics rising. And um, I kind of had a donor moment, and I got all stroppy with God. And I, I was like, what are you doing? So many people are praying into this area. They're your sons and daughters. Like, what are you doing about it? And I felt God say, in his ever, ever gentle, but kind of smack in the face way sometimes, I thought I told you to do something about that. How is that going? And um, I was making people wait. And maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe this book is of my own invention. I don't think that's the case, but maybe it is. And if, if that's the case, I've got nothing to lose. But if I'm right, and if God has commissioned me to fulfill this work, in my heel dragging and my dilly dallying and my finding more important stuff to do and making people wait. I love the Proverbs 31 um, script. It was given to me a few times when I was thinking about writing this book. And it's Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes. Speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. And I think that's our commission, always. Yep. And how that looks for each one of us will be different. Mm. But there are people counting on us. Lives and eternities are at stake. And um, I know I talked about kind of dragging my heels, but it's a good time to mention that we are called to run <coughs> our races with endurance, <coughs> not walk it, and not bimble. And definitely not sit around with our trainers on, full of good intentions, but never actually getting off the couch. No one ever got fit by putting on a pair of trainers and intending to go for a run. And nobody ever changed anything with having a heart full of good intentions and a head full of good ideas, but not being willing to move into action. If our spiritual lives and our callings are a race, we cannot afford to be the people at the back in the novelty rhino costumes. <laughs> we need to be the people who train for it, who are prepared and who are willing to follow the call of our guide and our marshal. And keep, keep eyes on the prize, keep going forward. That's right. And you might be sitting there going, yeah, well, Sarah, that's all well and good for you. You need to think, oh, by the way, I finished my book. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> There's a, I don't know, 
anyone watch is called the big one. Yeah. I love that. It's proper Sunday night TV. My husband watches anti throw so if you just uh, I'm still married, it's fine. Pray for him. <laughs> but um, after that is a uh, <laughs> and if you don't watch it, it's lovely. It's about a bunch of midwives uh, in the fifties, and some of them are nuns, and they all live in a convent, and then they um they go off and do midwifey things. And there's this really quirky elderly nun called Sister Monica Jane. And I don't know what was going on in this episode, but she said this hawker of a line once. She said that the hands of the Almighty are so often to be found at the ends of our own arms. Yeah. Yeah. St. Augustine puts it like this. We are to pray as though it all depends on God yeah. and work as though it all depends on us. And then I find it, when I read the book of Jonah, there's loads of stuff we can learn from him of what to do and what not to do. But also, I find it really interesting to look at the sailors on the boat to Tarshish. These men, presumably seasoned sailors, um, clearly know that this storm that's happened is not the normal storm, because they begin to cast lots to find out why this is happening. And meanwhile, Jonah's kind of taking a nap. And um, they know that he's running from his God because he told them when he got on the boat. And then they wake him up and he kind of sits there watching them a bit awkwardly as they try and work out why this is happening. And eventually they say to him, who is your God? Where are you from? And he says, oh, well, my God is the God, Lord God Almighty, Yahweh. And they, by reputation, have heard of God. And they start to cry out, why have you done this for us? So they've got this bloke on their boat who has brought this calamity on them. He's kind of lied by omission by keeping shtum whilst watching them try and work out why this is all happening. So they can't even feel that great towards him. But what do they do? Jonah says, well, throw me overboard then. It's the only thing to do. But they row like the clappers to get to shore to try and save this man who really probably doesn't deserve it. These men who don't know God are willing to, at great risk for themselves, try and save the man who brought trouble on them in the first place. Meanwhile, the man who does know God is running from his responsibilities to go and deliver a message that could save 120 lives, 120,000 lives. There are so many moral people in the world that don't know God. And thank God for the works that they do, um, self-sacrificially um, helping other people, improving the world around them, and finding cures for disease. But I'd argue that we as the church should be the most compassionate people on the planet. Yeah. If Jonah showed far less mercy than those unbelievers in the boat, he had his priorities out of whack. And if we're going to live up to our name of Christians, little Christs or Christ-like, then we need to up our game if the world is being more Jesus-like than we are. I think of this, and I'm sometimes asked if I'm really a Christian. <laughs> but um, Jesus was the man who we all know was moved to touch a leper who may have been passed out by his family for being unclean. He's the man who dined with sinners and outcasts and rejects. He's the man who stood between a woman who had just been dragged breastfed from the bed of adultery and a baying mob with rocks in their hands who want her blood on the floor to try and prove a point. He's that man. So we need to try and walk like him and talk like him and emulate him and drop his fragrance everywhere we go. People need us to live up to our name. Romans 8.19 says that for creation waits yeah. in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Yeah. And I love the Passion Translation of this, so I'm going to read that to you. It says that the entire universe is standing on tiptoes, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Mm. Church, friends, salt and light city on a hill. If all of creation is craning its neck to watch us, then
Let's give it something to watch. Let's live lives worthy of our calling and worthy of our Saviour. And worthy of the eternity that awaits. Could I have the worship team back? Stirring up the head. 